Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice. All right. So this episode of the Barbarian Hour, we're going to have Arizona State Assistant Coach Eric Thompson. Coach Thompson, welcome to the Barbarian Hour. Uh, Coach Thompson was an NAIA national champion for the Grandview. Is it Vikings? Vikings, yeah. The Vikings, and you guys won the team title every year. You were at Grandview, right? We did. We did. And recently, Coach uh, Colton Schultz in the NCAA Finals against Gable Stevenson. You guys were Pac-12 champions at Arizona State University and fourth in the NCAA tournament this past year. And this is your first year at Arizona State. Is that correct? It is, yeah. We moved out here October 1st. So So. you guys left State College, Pennsylvania for Tempe, Arizona. That yeah, that's the move, right? It's a little bit, a little bit of the move. Yeah, it was it was fun, man. It was crazy. It was good though. (laughs) Listen, you left the Midwest, like, first off, that's in the mountains. Uh yeah, it's in the mountains and it's it's Midwest. It's uh if there's a lot of trees around, there's a lot of green around, and now there's not, there's mountains around, but there's not trees and green around. Would you agree with that statement about Arizona? I would agree. You know what else Pennsylvania has? State College, a lot of rain. And I do not miss that. Lots of rain. Like it's raining here right now. Like my weather's pretty similar to State College where I am in uh, Northeast Ohio. Yeah. And it is, uh, I'm not a fan. I'm not going to lie to you. No. But- it got me a couple times. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is too much. Dude, it's crazy. Like, we get a lot here, too. Like, a lot, mm-hmm. a lot. And then, um, like, because it's spring now, like, right right on the, the border of spring and winter. We get yeah. a lot of snow here because we're at a higher elevation, and we're right on Lake Erie. So, it's like, we get the lake effect snow, so that's kind of miserable. Did you guys get uh, – how was the snow in State College? So, like, most of the time I was in Pennsylvania, it wasn't too bad, but then – this not this obviously not this last year the year before we had like four or five snowstorms where it was like well over a foot of snow and it was crazy and I was like this sucks dude so it was it was tough a couple times I was like out there shoveling I'm like and we had a real long like horseshoe driveway so it was like and all I I did like it hadn't snowed too bad so I really I just had like this two-stroke snowblower that was just like I would just like drop it on this huge pile. I pick it up, the snowblower, <laughs> drop it on this pile, and just let it eat down. My neighbor would be like, "That's not really how it works." I'm like, well, "That's how it's working right now, dude." <laughs> that's how Thompson does it. So mm-hmm. I'm doing it right. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like picking up this two-stroke engine, like snowblower. I'm like, I don't know, man. I gotta get out of here. I'm freezing. Bo- okay, so you're born and raised in Iowa, though, right? Yeah. Where at in, in Iowa? Uh, Northeast Iowa, Waverly. It's like, actually, I was born in, I was born in Waverly, but so Waverly, Shell Rock is like two separate towns. Shell Rock is like 1,500 people and Waverly is like 8,000, 9,000 people maybe. Um, so you go to elementary school in Shell Rock. So I grew up with 25 kids in a grade and then you go to junior high in Waverly. It's like 200. So Joel Greenlee is from – he went yeah. to Waverly Shell Rock. He was like the first real good dude ever to come out of Waverly Shell Rock High School. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a legend. His, so his mom was one of my elementary school teachers. Are you serious? That there is, yeah. Is, is, this is a real question. Is she six foot eight? Is she massive? She's, tall. she's, a, she's a tall woman, yeah. She's yeah. awesome. Because Justin is the opposite. Justin Greenlee is like a tall string bean type dude, right? Yeah. 
He used to come into Iowa State and wrestle with me when I was at Iowa State, too. J- Joel Greenlee is massive. Uh, yeah. Joel Greenlee is 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, easily 350 bills. E-Z. And still can move is what's wild about it. Because he used to train with Jeremy Johnson. He used to really still drill and train with Jeremy Johnson. That blew my mind. And yeah, then he was the... He was the number two to Bruce Baumgartner for a long time as well. Mm-hmm. He's, yeah, from, a, he's from your, from where you're from. Yeah. People are like, people are like, man, I can't believe how big you are. Like, like when people say how big I am, I'm like, I mean, but where I'm from, like, there's people that are much bigger than me. Like they're like my, in my, in, inside of my family, I'm not like even near the biggest person. Yeah. T- so, okay. So you're related to Tolly. Is, did Tolly yeah. go to Shell Rock too? No. So Tolly went to Janesville, which is like, so it goes like, Shell Rock, Waverly, Janesville. Janesville doesn't have a wrestling program anymore, so they wrestle for Waverly. Oh, so do they? they? So they let them actually family. go to Shell Rock, Waverly, Shell Rock High School. Okay. Yeah. So what? So he went to Janesville, and was he a state champ for Janesville? He wasn't. He was a runner-up twice. That's amazing to me. That is, and then he went to Nebraska, right? Yeah. So Tali went to Nebraska, and Joel and Justin had gone to U and I. So. Okay. So. so. So help me out then. So help then me you, out. Help so me out how you ended up at because you out of high school you were the number one you were the number one recruit in the country at heavyweight, right? Yeah. I remember you were on the ASICS chart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tali was an assistant. So then at this time Tali had come back from Nebraska and he was an assistant at UNI when I was getting recruited. And so I I kind of I mean I was really close. I mean UNI Iowa State Iowa, right? That was they're all like two hours from where I'm from or you and I is like 30 minutes. Um, and then I visited Chattanooga with Bono, but I mean, at the time it was like, Kale had just won his Olympic gold medal and he was assistant coach at Iowa state. And I mean, he, he went all out in recruiting me, you know, him and Hartung came to a high school football game of mine, like in Clear Lake, Iowa. So it was kind of, I mean, it just, at the end, I was like, man, I just kind of want to be at that guy. Cause you know, I, you know, I had a good feeling something special was going to happen. So you commit to Iowa state out of high school. What high, uh, what year did you graduate from Waverly Shaw Rock? 2008. So 08, you're an 08 grad. Yeah. Okay. He then leaves. Kale leaves after being the head coach at Iowa state for one season, I believe. Was it one or two? Uh, it was one or two. It was, it was two, a short, I think. short stint, right? Because he I was his first, Bobby Douglas. Yeah. Right? And then he, he, goes to, he goes to Penn State. He goes to State College, right? And obviously the rest of that is history. We all know that, right? Like, yep. But talk to me about entering there, getting there, being on the team, and then what happened at Iowa State for you personally, and then you end up at Grandview. What, what happened? What transpired? Yeah, so, I mean – it was just really tough. Like, I think for me, like if, if it would have, if Kale would have stayed or not, I'm not sure that it would have changed anything. Um, maybe it would have, who knows. Uh, but it just didn't, like, I was fairly immature and it was the first time in my life that I wasn't like the guy. Right. So it was real hard transition. Right. And I was behind Zabriskie, you know, we had some close wrestle offs and I was like, you know what, I'm going to get everybody. I'm not going to go to class anymore. I'm going to start doing things that aren't helpful. You know, things that things, you know, things that don't help you win. And and at a young age, when you do that, you think you're like getting everybody else. But realistically, it's just hurting yourself. So, you know, I kind of I stopped going to class. I wanted to. And then I was like, all right, man, I'm going home. So I moved back home to to Waverly, to Shell Rock. And I started going to community college and I worked at like a target distribution center, third shift. And I was like, I'm never going to wrestle again. I hate wrestling. I'm never doing it again, you know, and. My college coach, Nick Mitchell, and assistant Paul Reedy, they were like, got a hold of me and they were like, oh, come, come check it out, come check it out. And, you know, it wasn't wrestling that I hated. I was just frustrated with, you know, how things had went and I thought I deserved or whatever, you know, whatever you want to say that you think you deserve. But, um, you know, and, and they were like, well, come wrestle. And, and I came, I was like, all right, man, as long as I don't have to go back and work at a target distribution center in third shift, I'll pretty much do whatever you guys want me to do. How much different was the academic load from Iowa state? Now you're the, you're the guy again, right? You're the guy, you're the best guy on the team. Most likely. And they, they get good guys. Yeah. Grandview gets good guys. Right. And it's NAI. Right. So it's totally different. The academics are different. 
the full-time student status is, I don't even know, you got to have 12 hours to be a full-time student at NAI? Yep. Same, same thing, same academics and stuff. Really, to be honest, it was like, and it was never academics were never like an issue for me. It was just like, like you just got to go do it. Right. That's, I mean, that's all college, any school ever. Like if you show up, you know, I mean, obviously there's some exceptions to that, but if you show up and try your hardest, most of the time it's going to be okay. Right. You take advantage of your tutors, you take advantage of the the people you have around you and, and all the stuff that's offered to you, you're going to be fine. Um, you know, like for me, it was kind of a little bit better for me at Grandview because it was like, if you show up to class and you pay attention, you take notes, like it's going to be fine where Iowa State, there were some bigger classes, but it's still the same thing. So it was, a, it was a wrestling passion issue for you not being the guy. And it was just the environment for you. It wasn't anything about, you know, hate school. It wasn't anything like that. It was like, no. yeah. I'm not the guy. I'm losing tough wrestle loss to an NCAA champ. This yeah. is tough, right? I mean, it was pl- yeah. probably more of that than like, oh, this academics is crushing me. Not that, right? No, yeah, that's pretty much what it was. It was just a, like, you know, it was immaturity of a frustration, you know, that's something that should have been momentary. And I let like dominate me, like where I was just like thinking about like, well, now I'll never get my chance, you know, which is not true. You know, it's, it's never that, that dramatic, but when you're younger, it happens, right? So were you there for the transition from Kale leaving to Kevin Jackson? Yep. So that was right after my red shirt year. And, and so he comes in with things a lot different or was it different? Was it the same? What was that like? It was different, but it was still, I mean, it's high level coaching and that's what really, you know, so it went from like one high level coach to another. So it was, it was pretty, you know, transparent, pretty much just similar, very similar stuff, but you know, different personalities a little bit too, you know, so you have Jake Varner in the room. You have Dave Zabriskie in the room. So you got really good partners, obviously great partners, right? Like, yeah. so, you're, so you leave there. You're working at a Target distribution center. Coach Mitchell reaches out, and you're like, hey, anywhere but here, right? Like, what's, what, what do I got to do? So it's like, in Des Moines, it. right? Like, yeah. uh, in Des Moines. Like, Grand University is in Des Moines, Des Moines yeah, right? right? In the in city. The city? Yep. So you leave Target distribution center, go yep. there. Put him Talk two about weeks. the two. How, wait, how long was it? I was just kidding. I moved. I, Metro called me, and I literally moved to Des Moines like a week later. I was like, <laughs> "All right, let's do it." Give me Talk a about high. it though. Talk about making the transition to, to Grandview. You know what it did for you? Yeah, I came. I came back, man, and I just. I started like you know I got there, and I still had issues too, right? It wasn't like everything just went away and I was fine, right? You still have like demons and things you're trying to deal with and things you're trying to figure out. Um, but, you know, it's just the way he kind of like handled me, the way the, the, the things Coach Reedy did, who's an assistant there and still, I mean, associate head coach now, but, you know, the sacrifices they made in their personal lives to help me become, you know, just helpful to other people and, and to be successful in my life, you know, and to, to meet my wife and actually like be okay to be in an adult relationship, you know, and, and those kinds of things. But, you know, it was just a lot of maturing and being around people that really, really cared about me. And I was also like, it was just, just growing up really. And I, and I did, I found my passion for wrestling again. I, I found like, you know, I love wrestling and I, and I, you know, and I always did. It was just frustration, you know, and I let it, I let it push this love out, you know, where I was just frustrated. But I mean, it was, it was guys, you know, Mitchell and Reedy and, you know, everyone in the program, Grant Turner, um, you know, just all the guys involved, you know, I just, I went with like Ryak Finch and Chad Lohman. They were my teammates, Brandon Wright, you know, being around guy, other guys who were high level wrestlers who were also, had gone through their frustrations and we're figuring it out. So. So now as a coach, you see this type of stuff happening. Can you go put your arm around a guy and be like, Hey man, I've been there. I know what you're going through because you think about this. You're at, you know, Nittany land wrestling club is at Penn state. Right. Yeah. And then, well, with the COVID years, it was in some weird places. You guys mm-hmm. got creative. I know that, but Everybody had to do that. Ohio State yeah. had to do that, right? Everybody who had a, pro- a program couldn't be in the university campus. So you guys had to do some creative stuff. You did it, right? Yeah. Everybody, you, all the campuses you've been on are like traditional 
top 10 college best towns. Tempe, Arizona, State College, Pennsylvania, Ames, Iowa. Like, yeah. people get it done there. They like to go out and have fun. <laughs> Did you ever have any problems with any of that at any of the, any of the places you went when you were immature and young? Yeah, so not so much my freshman year at Iowa State, but, my, but the next year after Kale left, yeah, I was just like – partying you know like lost focus of like true sacrifice you know most of my you know and I tell I tell you know when Pritz Pritz starts calling me a freak and stuff for being so big and we go back and forth you know I tell him all the time the reason I'm so big is because you know dude I went to bed at nine o'clock almost my, my entire life every single night like I specific, I don't have this sort of self control anymore. But I specifically remember I'd be playing like PS2 NCAA football, you know, and I could stand up. The clock would say nine o'clock, no matter where I was in the game. I could stand up, turn off the PS2, turn off the TV, go to sleep. <laughs> I've never even heard of what you're talking about right now. That That's like a superpower, dude. Crazy. I can't do it now, but I mean, well, you got like, a kid now, and it's right. the game has changed as you and I will probably talk about, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, I was like, you know, so then I went to college and it was kind of like, people don't do that. You know, people are up late and they do that. And I'm like, and that's where I think like one thing for me and I, and I talk about a lot to our guys is like the best vitamin and, and thing you can do to make sure that you, you know, cause everyone's into supplements and would say protein, do these things. I'm like, dude, go to sleep. You want to feel good, go to sleep, wake up earlier, you know, these kinds of things. I took a nap like last night. I've been, my son's been wanting to stay in the same. He wants to sleep in the same bed as me. Yeah. And it's just not very good sleep. I'm not going to lie to you. He kicks me. It's like an octopus, a drunk octopus trying to find his keys. He kicks you. And he, you know I mean? It's, it's, but he sleeps. <laughs> I don't sleep so much, but you know, I'm just like pumped to be there. I love my kids. So I'm like, all right, I don't get a ton of good sleep when I do that. Right. So I literally, before this, I went out to breakfast with my wife. I came back and I took a nap. I was like, <laughs> I got to take a nap. I'm a nap guy. I'm an old man, yeah. like nap guy, but I've always been a nap guy. I've always been yeah. a nap guy. I've always been a nap. I love naps, but like what you're talking about, like good, deep sleep is the, you would, it is unbelievable. It heals your body. It's good for your organs. It's great for your brain. It's the ultimate thing that if you want to be healthy, sleeping is the good sleep is the ultimate thing yeah absolutely and and you know there's like a my one of my best friends my best man at my wedding and stuff he's a he's like the smartest dude i know he went to university of chicago medical school went to iowa state undergrad and now he's at michigan uh residency and he's like they don't have like a ton of these like of exactly what happens when you sleep but he's like the healing and the things when you hit your REM cycle he was telling me about all these things that it does for your body and it's just unbelievable. Yeah, rapid eye movement, right? And that, that's what yep. REM is. So it's crazy. If that's your deep sleep. That's like the sleep you need to be. I mean, dude, what it does for your organs is incredible. Like how I feel after a long sleep, because you don't get them much anymore when you become a parent. At least I don't. But it's just like, it's because you're always like worried about the noises and where your kids are. and Because my kids like wander around our house and sleep wherever so i'm like where'd they go now where's this one i don't know where that one is we only got two kids i can't imagine having five like my parents had but oh my God. you're right though the sleep thing is crazy and nobody does it in college right nobody sleeps normally in college even if you look at like let's just say penn state right like they're probably have more regular schedules than the regular college kid right like you were there you were in that program they live right yeah they're probably not even getting the 10, 12 hours of sleep that you were probably getting when you were turning the PS2 off at 9 p.m., right? Yeah, it was crazy, man. I just – I so I think about that fairly often and, like, maybe we'll kind of – that that played on my, my brain when I got to college a little bit, you know, which we can't be that fragile. But, you know, I think about that kind of stuff. Um, and I talk to our guys about that, you know, and I talk to our guys about not getting frustrating. And Frank taught – you know, Frank's – Frank does a great job with like the mindset stuff with our guys, you know, and, and truly, you know, and he's always, he said, don't get weird, you know, wrestling, the season's a long, it's a long season, you know, so just stay present in the moment. Don't get too caught up in all the things because they're just things, right? Like all that really matters is staying, 
healthy and positive and wanting to get better. Frank Molinaro, I told him, and I mean this, the proudest I've ever been to be an American besides being in London for when Burroughs won, because I was pretty proud then. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> I was pretty proud. But when he took fifth in the Olympics and he lost to Chimizo in that, that bronze medal match, go back and watch that after we do this. Oh, today. Yeah. It's about how round. hard he fights till the very last second where he almost gets a takedown on Chimizo. Oh, cool. Yeah. Dude, he just battles. And we all know Chimizo is a freak. Everybody knows that about the guy, yeah. but how hard that guy battled is crazy. Like how hard he fought and what, how, what he laid on the line there. And, you know, he's the type of guy, he's an Olympian. He can always say that. Right. Mm. But you know, he lost by, he lost a narrow decision to Frank Chimizo, who's a total mutant world champion, a bunch yeah. of different, you know, has moved up and he, you know, he didn't medal, but I think the dude's got a lot to be proud of. And, and that's a part of the, once again, he's a Penn state guy. He's a yeah. Penn state guy. And you know, what's crazy about him? Frank Molinaro wasn't on the transition. He was a, he was under the old staff. I believe as a true freshman yep. at Penn state. Mark Perry was his coach. How wild is that? crazy right it's totally crazy it's like it blows my mind to think about it because frank was a part of the whole culture change and i think mm -hmm. when you're kale you come in and you do what you do you get guys that are going to buy in some aren't or you don't want to buy in see you later yeah right yeah it's crazy it's crazy and then you know you were a part of that program as well with the knee line wrestling club so you yep. guys got a pretty firm grasp on what it takes to win at the highest level oh man blows my mind blows my mind. but okay so just just i feel like i'm slighting grandview i want to hear more about grandview because you guys won every time you were there you guys won as a team right yep and and, and national you rules too and you won i did so what is the nai tournament like compared to the ncaa tournament right we were just at the ncaa tournament in detroit three days ago talk yeah, about I mean, the difference it's not quite you know it's not 20,000 people, but there's, there's a lot of people there. Probably say by four or 5,000. Um, it's, it's cool. You know, it's, it's a little bit different because, so, I mean, I always forget people don't really know about this, but like in NAI, you can take 12 guys to NAI nationals and you can take like two guys at a weight. So you could take two guys at six weights. Who's the scorer, the who the high highest place, or do you have to designate who the scorer is? So at nationals, so yeah, you, you have yourself. to be like before the tournament. Eric Thompson's scoring, uh, you know. Eric Thompson's going to score, and I'm just thinking Jeremy Johnson's not going to score. Right? I'm just saying, have you yeah. around your era ish, right? So they do all all twelve are scorers if you qualify all twelve. All 12. So okay, you send, you send twelve guys to to regionals. And so basically if you qualify 12 guys, then they all go to nationals and they're all scorers. So everybody scores. And was that the formula for a Grandview? And is that how Life University was able to knock Grandview off? Um, they are not like they knock Grandview off because Grandview I mean they Life had a crazy good tournament and Grandview had a crazy bad tournament. They wrestled pretty poorly. You know, Mitchell and Reedy will tell you the same. And did they both this last year bring twelve? They did they both bring twelve? Do you? Do they always take twelve? I would think so. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I would think that, so. It's just like a like a like a Penn State brings ten guys to nationals, or you know, who, whoever you know. The most of the good teams qualify all their guys 12, 11, 12, 10. I mean, you have to, right? You have to. It's it's, it's a numbers game. Everybody knows that. Yeah you can't it's really hard to win with six guys even if you're Penn State. I mean that's what we you know that's what we we're talking about it's like Zeke's a big math guy right so he's like the average points go average guy on your team their average points you know and you average it out that way and you got to get you got to get more points you know yeah that's bottom line it's a numbers game so okay when you were there you guys won every year you won everywhere every year you were the best guy in the building every year right um, Brock Gutches was pretty good. Brock Gutches was pretty good. Yeah, I'll give you that. At one he always got. He, it was always crap, though, man. He always got wrestler of the tournament. I always told him this too. He should have gotten outstanding wrestler in wrestler of the year the two years he won it. But at the tournament, my last two years, I teched or pinned everybody, and he had like a five-two heater in the finals. I'm like, what are we doing? And he won like three-two a couple times. <laughs> He's pretty good. 
Oh yeah, he's freaking good. And what's crazy is you guys are both like cousins to like world class dudes. That's what's wild yeah. about it to me. Yeah, it was funny. Like the one year after NAI and Nationals, I went out to uh, Colorado Springs to train, and like I opened the dorm room, and it was him. He was my roommate. I was like, "What are you doing here?" <laughs> I, like, I don't even want to be the funny. Southern Oregon guy. Uh, it's funny, and he's from Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. He's from like around Crater Lake, I think. It's, he's from Crater, Oregon, which I think is in and around-ish Crater Lake. Dude, Oregon's huge. Have you been to Oregon? I haven't. Go to Oregon. Go to Oregon. I'm going to tell you right now, you're welcome. Go to Oregon. You need to go amazing. check it out? Yeah, I got married there. It's amazing. My best friend lived in Portland for like 15 years and almost 20 years, and I used to go like 18 years. He just moved out because – I don't know if you pay attention to what happened in the summer of 2020. They destroyed a lot of American cities. Never heard of it. No, not, you don't know about that? Okay. And his city, you know, they, the city like Seattle, uh, San Francisco, and um, Portland really took the brunt of that, like certain areas, certain parts of it. Like some areas are still really nice, right, obviously. Um, he had to get out of there. Portland's so he left. Bad, but, what's that? Portland's pretty bad. I've seen like a – my wife and I love TikTok, so I've seen a couple of TikToks of Portland that's like destroyed. They've got a port. They have a really bad like homeless problem in Portland, Oregon, and it's it's like unfortunate yeah. because it's a beautiful yeah. place, man. Beautiful place. So okay, so you and Brock got just the two best guys every year, right? Yeah, I mean, but he kept winning everything because their team wasn't close to winning, and everyone hated Grandview, so. <laughs> so they always yeah, wanted. They were always voting against you guys. Yeah, Brock got all the freaking awards. <laughs> That's how it goes, I guess. Okay, so you you're there, everything. and you guys wrestle in the Midlands. You wrestle yeah. in all these other tournaments. What was your best finish at Midlands? I got seventh one year, and then I got a concussion another year. So I, I guess I guess one year, I think when I was at Iowa State, I think I got fifth. fifth. Maybe. You know who I wrestled was Mike Tamalo. Did you? He was like 30. And I was like 20 and dude, he wrestled so hard. I think it was like 16, 13 and he, and he beat me and I was like, <gasps> <laughs> but he's like an adult male, right? And he's a 97. Yeah. But he was like 220, 230 and I wasn't yeah. much bigger. So I got this crazy Tamalo at Midlands. Yeah. <laughs> That's so weird. Isn't that crazy? That's really crazy. So, and I think Tamalo is like an 08 grad, isn't he at the Northwestern? Yeah, he, uh, yeah, I don't know. Dude, Dude he, I hung out with that guy in the Olympics in London. He just, like, showed up out of, out of nowhere, and he kind of looks like Martin Floriani. He really does, doesn't he? Totally does, and he's, like, kind of, like, eccentric like Martin, Martin Floriani, but he was cool to deal with. But you guys wrestled at the middle, it's so bizarre. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, so did you ever get to the point, like, now nah, we obviously know you could, but did you ever get to the point where you and Tolly got the workout and you could get him? By the time – by the time I could get him, I didn't really like want to. Like, I mean, I don't know if it really ever came, came to like where I was like, you know, it's like, it's like that thing of like, like when you can beat up your dad, like, do you really want to beat him up anymore? Or are you just like, oh, okay. I've had it happen to me. <laughs> do you, do you want to hear, do you want to hear about it? I do kind of want to hear it. Okay. So I, I'm going to make this quick because I got you on the clock and we only got about 34 minutes left. My dad, I went and I, he went somewhere and I borrowed like this truck that they bought, like this S10 truck, you know, like the little truck and I get it and I'm driving it all around and he was out of town for the weekend and he comes back and my, the truck broke down. It wouldn't start. So I went home and I got a ride home and I got another truck. They're hillbillies. So my dad's got like a lot of trucks and trailers. So I trailer the truck home strap it down do what you're supposed to trailer at home 15 miles from our hometown of oak harbor we live out in the country on a farm i get home and i'm like hey dad this truck won't run he's like well did you did you look under the hood did you check the oil i was like oh yeah i looked under the hood i can't figure it out i'm not a mechanic turns out i'm going to school to be a social studies teacher so he gets <laughs> under there and he's like opens it up and he's like look at the battery terminal it's corroded what are you stupid and I'm like, uh, Dad, just calm down, man. He's like, get me a wire brush. So he gets a wire brush. And 
uh, he starts wire brushing it, and he's just like, "You're so stupid! I can't oh, yeah. believe how dumb you are! You need to go back to college for five more years! You're such a moron!" And then he starts mfing me, and I'm like, "Hey, just calm down. That's enough. <laughs> ah, you're f this, f that. You're stupid." And my dad had um, he'd been chewing since he's twelve, so this is twenty years ago. So my dad would have been he's seventy three now. This would, he'd have been fifty three years old, right? I was twenty two. You let an old man beat you up. Oh, oh no. So my dad's been chewing tobacco at that point for 41 years, yeah. right? His teeth look like Indian corn. <laughs> so he's screaming at me. And I'm like, hey, that's enough. I'll talk to you however I want to talk to you, boy, punk. So I went over both of his arms and I body locked him and his hip popped. And he buckled, falls flat on his back. Oh no. And I'm like, and I go and like do this to me. I'd never stood up to my dad. I'd never yelled back at him. Nothing. Right. Yeah. And I felt terrible in that moment. Oh, right. Man. So I'm like, dad, I'm so sorry. Let me help you up. And he's like, Oh, I'm fine. And he grabs my leg at the ankle, right at the foot like this with his Indian corn teeth. Luckily I had pants on. He bites the meat of my calf. So at first I'm like, oh, that hurts. Ah, let go. And I'm like screaming. Then I'm like, ah, let go. He's, this is 20 seconds, right? And he's biting. He's trying to take a hunk out of my leg. Luckily I had a pair of pants on because I'm a shorts guy all the time. So I like take my thumb and I start digging it in his neck and I'm smacking him in the face and I couldn't punch him, dude. I couldn't bring oh, myself to yeah. punch him. I'm choking him. I'm poking him. I'm slapping him in the face. <laughs> So finally, as hard as I could, I squatted. I just squatted into like a catcher stance and his like jaw broke loose. And there's there's skull, skull wintergreen fine cut, if you're wondering. <laughs> skull wintergreen fine cut, blood and spit all over my leg. He broke the skin. And I'm like, I'm screaming at him. I'm like, what is wrong? Who bites their own kid? What is wrong with you? And he's like, shouldn't mess with me, boy. I still got some left. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> So, so I know how you feel. Okay? I know how you, if his hip was okay. I mean, he just had it, he's going to, uh, wait, what's he, yeah, he just had it replaced. The same hip he had to have it replaced last summer. So he got it done. <laughs> there you go, buddy. I know how you feel. And I did yeah. it. And I, you know what though? He clapped back pretty immediately. Yeah, he got you. Within yeah, 10 so seconds. We never really had like our, our moment, but I mean, Tali was so helpful with my wrestling, man. Like, you know, just more so, you know, I was 15, 16 years old, and I was working out with him probably once a week when he was winning a bronze medal in the world. So very helpful. He, and he wasn't like exactly, you know, he wasn't there to, to like nurture me along. He was there to beat me into getting ready to be tough. So it worked. I got tough, yeah. Yeah, it worked. Cool. You're pretty good. So yeah. I remember calling matches for you in, in Madison. Yeah. That was like my first real, like, actual. Because I think I saw you in Fargo. I saw you win in Fargo because I would go out and, like, 08, you won in Fargo. 07, 08, I think you won in Fargo. Yep. That's so summer I, after my senior year. Yeah. So I remember going to Fargo and seeing you and being like, okay, this guy's good. I get that. And then, and then you, like, you know, you disappeared out of the, the eye because you went to NAI school and you weren't yep. on the Big Ten Network or on ESP, oh, yeah. right? So, so it's like, and it was right at the beginning when I started doing flow wrestling. And um, then you disappeared. And I was like, then you pop up. And I'm like, oh, my God. Dude, you were doing kitchen sink stuff in Madison. I'm like, this dude's nuts. It was awesome. I remember it. I don't even know who you were wrestling. I did. You did like a lat. You did so. You were doing all this crazy stuff. I'm like, this dude can roll. And then they put you on my mat again. And I was like, this is like a gift. Yeah, I beat Connor Medbury. And then I got beat by Dom, but at the end of my match with Dom, I, like, was overhooked, and I kicked his leg out and ankle-picked the other one, and he almost went to his back, and we challenged it, but didn't get it. And then at the end, I, like, shot a high C, he rolled me through, but it was good. It was fun. Yeah. I loved it. I loved your style, man. It was, like, kitchen yeah, sink. Style. You just got after it. You didn't have a whole lot of regard for your body, which I appreciate. No, it, it, I pay for it. <laughs> I pay for it now. <laughs> <laughs> but paying for it now, right? Like you're wrestling with with Colton, and Colton's massive. He told me he's 284. Yeah, he's big. 
Yeah. He's got, I mean, he has to be like, you know, really you look at, you look across the board at some of these Greco guys, um, you know, overseas, they're, they're monsters, right? They're huge. Like a, like a, uh, the Turkish. Caliop. Caliop. Is it? And, uh, you know, even the Cuban. So oh it's like, God, dude, you, gotta, you know, we gotta go, we gotta get big. Mian Lopez is dude. He's what was he? Six, six, six. He's Very huge. Close he he's is monster, massive. Dude. dude, he is huge. And it's just this whole deal. But he, okay. yeah, he's, a, he's a monster too. You think he's done? I don't know. I don't know. I don't the know what he wants to do. The economics of Cuba are not so it's good. Crazy. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, um, so he, <laughs> how wild is that? <laughs> he would, yeah, I mean, I'd imagine, I mean, I guess I don't, I don't know what they would have him be doing, you know, if he's not wrestling, um, like what's his career, but I don't know. It's just wild to see someone is that big, but I mean, that's what Colton, Colton has to be that big though. You know, he needs to be, he needs to, to train at that size and he needs to be there a lot consistently. So I just, felt like in that final match, you know, he was the best matchup for Gable, but yeah. the, North, the Northwestern dude gave Gable fits. Did you guys get to watch that at all? Yeah, I watched that match. What did you think? He's a di- I mean, he's di- he's different than Colm, but yeah, he's, Lucas is good. He's pretty tough. Lucas is massive, first off. He's huge, yeah. and he's he's trimmer. Yeah, he's, he's going to be he's strong. He's He'll strong. Be fun to He'll be fun. Hopefully he's a guy with Colm gets to wrestle, wrestle in the future. Absolutely. I and mean, how about heavyweight being an all-time great weight class this year, too? Not nuts. <laughs> how do you guys plan for all those guys? How do you scout them all? And the w- Wood is way better than people give Wood credit for, by the way. Yeah, I mean, look what he did on that backside. Yeah. It's unreal. I mean, even on the front, like he beat Cassiope, and that match with Colton was crazy. So it's like the dude was in crazy matches all weekend and winning them. And, and the field, and I think the field says more about it even. You're in these crazy matches, but the field says a lot more about it, like how good the field was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then Nebraska, was it Jen, Lance, is it? Yeah, Christian Lance. A Christian Lance. Oh, my God. How about that guy? He's a it's D2 crazy. guy. You got to well, love that, right? He was real hurt, too. Yeah, so it's funny. When I came out here for my interview, there was a Sunkiss camp going on. So I went over there and wrestled, and I wrestled Christian the one day. He is a great kid, really, really nice kid. And what, what did he come from, Fort Hayes? Fort Hayes State, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. It's wild. Dude, I love it because Terval's a, you, uh, a, a loper, right? He's carny. Yeah. So it's like I like that. I think that, that, that heavyweights are more likely, likely to be able to take alternative paths than the other weights. Sigmund. Sigmund is a D2 guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, uh, Bruce Baumgartner went to Indiana State, but they were D2, D1 D then, right? So yeah. it's, like, kind of wild to see it all. I mean, it's just, like, really wild. If, I mean, honestly, I, like, love it, though. I like, I like a good story like that. I like your redemption story, dude. Like, Yeah. I mean, it's, like, what, you know, it's, it's very American, right? Yes. Like, it's, like, oh, you figure it out, like, and then you do, and it's, like, this is great. Tell me about the Target Distribution Center. Tell me about however long you worked there. Tell me the worst thing about it. It was like six months, five months maybe. There's this guy there. Um, he was Dwight from the office, except I didn't realize how funny it was until like three months in. <laughs> and he would tell me these stories like, like one day it was like me and him just going back and forth about, you know, he told me his hands were registered lethal weapons. And then the next day he brought in like a, like a Velcro black belt and was like, this is my black belt. And I used to like hold up these cardboard boxes and have him punch them and be like, oh, yeah. not real. Was, and then he told me he got bit by a rattlesnake on a 30 mile hike across um, Arizona. <laughs> uh, but he got bit at the 15 mile mark. He said, it was either die or go another 15. And I was like, you died. <laughs> That's what happened. But it was stories like that every single day. And it was just like, and I, I used to make like at first, like the first probably like six weeks of it, it made me really mad. I was like, this dude is an idiot. You know, like it made me like really upset until I got to a place where I was like, you know, 
you need to be nicer. I needed to be nicer. And I just like let people kind of spin their wheels, you know, let them tell me this stuff. And then just like, like by the end of it, like when I told him I was leaving, he like hugged me and we were like best friends. So you embraced Dwight. Yeah, I did. I figured it out. <laughs> like it was hilarious, dude. He, he and he, and all, like he's just full of crap, but he's just a really nice person though too. He was, he was really kind. I love it. <laughs> it was great, man. It was, it was fun. It was fine. It, but the worst part about it was it was like second shift or third shift. I went in there at like 4 p.m. and left at like 2 a.m. It was awful. And that messed up your whole sleep, the sleep thing, your sleep thing. You were wrong up your sleep for two years, yeah. it sounds like. Yeah, and then I would get done with that, and I'd go sleep at my grandma's house in Cedar Falls for like five hours, and then I would go to class at Hawkeye Community College. Oh, and then God. Dude, you, you – you got the down. You got a little bit of the down and out life, didn't you? It was fun though, man. I was just like going. I sleep in my car sometimes. I just oh be God. going. But that's like you, dude. Look at you now, though. Look at look look your last two programs. Look at the last two programs you've been a part of, right? Including right now. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, man. It's like it's like you never you never really know what's gonna happen. So you just kind of go, right? What do you like? Like, am I gonna? You know, and there was definitely times, you know, it's funny, like, I'm so much different, you know, since I've had kids, you know, realistically, since I, since I had my, my kids, uh, you know, I, it's funny, I get like me five years ago, I wasn't negative, but I also wasn't positive either. Like now I just like, I get in the car and every day I ask my son, hey buddy, today's a great day to have a good day, huh? Or a good day to have a great day. And he always just screams no at me, but. I mean, it's just like that, like of that thing of like, you got to find, you know, where you're going to be happy and you tell yourself it's a place or it's a person or a thing, but the only person that's going to make you happy is you. And then you can make others around you happy, you know, with who you are and, and how you do things. Tell me the story about getting contacted. Who brought you into Nittany Lion Wrestling Club and what's the story there? So my senior year at Grandview. What year is that? 14? 2013, 2014 13. is when I graduated. 14, okay. So I texted Kale in probably February. And I said, hey, you know, I don't know if you guys have anything available. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to continue training, you know. And he's like, well, let's talk about it after season, you know. So Grandview does this thing where they graduate a week earlier. Um, so you graduate April, the end of April at Grandview so that you can go and look at jobs earlier. It's kind of their thought, which is really smart, right? If you don't, you think about that way, uh, like I can start a week earlier than everybody else, you know? So, um, it was probably like the middle April 20th or something. And I texted Kayla and I was like, Hey, you know, I know we talked about it, but, um, you should get a hold of you after season. I was, I'm not sure if you guys still... And he said, yeah, yeah, we want to hire you. Come on out. And so I moved out there right after the Olymp right after those world team trials in 2014. Like I packed up my car with two duffel bags, um, my fishing pole, my shotgun, um, some bedding stuff. And then I moved into my wife's great aunt's house who was 75 years old. And I slept, I lived in the basement. Just like your wife, you were you married at that point? Uh, we were engaged at the time. Was the shotgun a Remington 870 or a Mossberg 500? Uh, 870 Express. Same Z's, same Z's. Woodstock? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Because I got a polymer one too. I got the polymer one too. Nah, I just got the Woodstock. I have both. I mean, you got to have both. I mean, I detasseled all summer corn and rogued. When I was 11 and I lied on the job application and said I was 14 or 12, 12 or 14. And I detasseled and rode all the summer and I took my 515 an hour and I took my paycheck and I went and bought a Remington 870 Express. I love it. Remington 870 Express is probably one of the more iconic duck hunting guns that there is, I think. Yeah, that is the Mossberg 500, right? Yeah, it's economical. I feel like every yeah. kid for shotguns. 300 bucks, whatever. Yeah. yeah, or or you can go Benelli. Mm, mm. I'm not going Benelli. <laughs> mm, what's a Benelli? It's like two grand, right? So expensive. So expensive. I'm all set. Like the Kimber, a Kimber pistol. No, thanks. Yeah. I mean, go 
Glock, go Sig, go S and W. Come on. I mean, you don't need to you don't who needs a Kimber? Stop it. Those things Stop are, it with the Kimbers. It's, I mean, like, it's like they tell you you can drop it in mud and stuff, and it's like, well, don't drop it. Well, yeah. No, yeah, don't do that. It'll fire. I have a really sweet SIG, six hour, uh, 1911, uh, yeah. 45. It's a 1911, but it has a rail system on it. It's called a Blackhawk, I think, or something like that. It's like too nice. It's too nice. So then I just got Glocks. Yeah, it's too scary, right? You like use number one or like it's like, uh, nah, yeah, I want Glocks. Get a big Glocks. You can do whatever you want. You can bury it in the yard and dump yeah, water on it every day and it'll still fire or something a year later. So, but Remington 870, do you still got it? Um, I do. It's at my in-laws' house in Pennsylvania. Okay. So I don't, I don't have it out here. I just have my my pistol. Dog. Okay. I don't know if guns were illegal out there. I know they are in California. No, Arizona's wild west, dude. Like Is the it? actual wild west. Yeah. yeah. Well, no. Yeah, literally, it was. Like that's when they talk yeah. wild west, it was. But okay, so you're at you were there from 2014 in state college to 2021. Is that correct? So I left for one year. Um, and coached at Lock Haven for a year. But you didn't leave. You were the same. Because I don't know if people know. Same area, 45, 45 minutes. minutes apart. 40 minutes apart. Yeah. yeah, so I was in central Pennsylvania, and I stayed there for a year. And then I was, I was really close to taking a job at Brown with Coach Beckerman. And basically, I called Kale for a letter of recommendation, you know, just to get through the process. And I was going to do it. And uh, basically, he was like, well, why don't you just come back here and coach the club? And I was like, but then I wouldn't have to sell my house. I wouldn't have to move. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so I came back from 17 to 21 and, and coached. And, and then and that's right, right when David opened uh, M2 as well. So it was kind of a natural fit right away. So you were, were you uh, Nittany Land Wrestling Club and M2? Yep. So, so simultaneously, what were the workouts with M2 and what were the workouts with Nittany Land Wrestling Club? Yeah, so we go in in the morning with NLWC and do workouts. And then in the afternoons, you usually go at like 1.30 or 2 o'clock. Um, and then I would generally come home, pick the kids up from daycare. Sarah would get home from teaching. I would eat, and then I would either go do a private lesson or I would do a practice and then another practice, and it just kind of did went that way, and I did a lot of lessons and a lot of privates and a lot of, like, practices and stuff. So M2, the schedule was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Sunday. So then Friday and Saturday was a lot of, like, lessons and stuff. Those guys are pretty easy to deal with, too, when it comes to, like, this is what I feel like I deserve, and they're, they're pretty fair guys, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I always and you know I never had any issues. It was, it was you know my experience at Penn State and at M two. It was nothing but positive. You know I I couldn't say anything that it wasn't you know exactly what I what I uh, uh, expected or that it was like a negative at all. You know I learned a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> those guys know a lot. Uh, fly on the wall. <laughs> When you get to see Kyle Snyder, Coach Sanderson, and David Taylor in a three-man group, what is that like? Battle Royale. He can still roll. Kyle Sanderson can absolutely still roll with those guys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, yeah, he doesn't, you know. He's got too many tricks, and he's too strong, and he just knows how to wrestle. That's unreal, man. He can still low single those guys. Oh, yeah. It's wild. Hey, how about when he came back in 11 – People are so dumb that they don't realize he lost to Albert Saritov for bronze. I don't know if you know yeah. that. Did you know that? Yeah, he, and he lost to uh, Sharifov. Sharifov. Sharif Sharifov, Sharifov, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, but the, everyone's like, he lost to some guy, some tall, lanky, long, lanky redhead. Uh, One of the all-time greats with the craziest hit list of all time. Dude, have you ever seen I, – I, okay, so I saw him. I went to the 2009 Russian Nationals, and he wrestled. First off, he was 84 kilos. He's 6'4". He, the huge. dude's massive. So, yeah. I guess the roundabout, he was, he was bronze in Rio in, in Snyder's weight. Snyder beat him like 8'2", right? Yeah. Albert Saritov has beaten literally everybody because he's like a double overhook guy, and he's like long, he's lanky, and he's just like total mutant, dude. Yeah. And, and like people like, oh, well, he took, he got fifth. And I'm like, no, the guy who beat him for, fifth, for, fifth, for third is a mutant and he's an Olympic bronze medalist. And he, I think he went to Romania. 
because he killed Azerbaijan. Him. Yeah, R- Romania, Azerbaijan, wherever he went to. Well, that Sharif off Azerbaijan. Yeah, I believe Albert Sharitov was with Romania, like he transferred. Yeah, that sounds months. right. Yeah, the Romania. So anyhow, yeah. that's who beat Kale for bronze. Sharitov's a freak, dude. Yeah, he's beating a bunch of dudes. He's beating everybody, and, and um, so he lost to Gadisov. Gadisov was eighteen, and Gadisov won the eighty-four kilo. Uh, 2009 Russian Nationals. He beat Albert Saritov in the finals. How about that? That's a crazy weight class. Could you talk about <laughs> with you? Oh my God! How nuts is that? But that's who that's who Kale lost to. Um. Okay. Yeah. So he's just unreal, man. And obviously Kyle Snyder, um, one of our youngest world champions, Olympic champions ever. And then, um, talk about your what happened to end up in Tempe. What happened to you? So, you know, like Frank and I have been close, you know, since he was at, since we were together at Penn State, Um, you know, we'd always kind of talked about it and stuff, but I just really hadn't, you know, there was a bunch of, a bunch of opportunities that come through, but we had a nice life in State College, you know, and I wasn't really in a hurry, but, you know, Arizona State's a team that's returning with, you know, we got, they won a trophy last year and they won another one this year. So it's like, those jobs aren't coming to open. You know, teams that win trophies and return all those guys, they aren't like, oh, they aren't readily available, you know. So the opportunity to come out here and, and you know, be with Frank. And then I also went on the cadet world team cadet world team this last summer with Levi Haynes when I was coaching at M2. And I hung out with Pritz quite a bit. And I was like, oh, this dude's cool. Like, I'm, so it's funny. Pritz has coached against me against every dude that's ever beaten me. He coached Dom, he coached uh, Tyrell Fortune, and somebody else. But we were talking about it the other day. He's like, yeah, I watched a lot of your tape. I'm like, get away from me, Pritz. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you know, so, so I kind of – Pritz got back and, and uh, here and, and basically told Zeke he's our guy, you know, because they wanted somebody for Colton. They wanted somebody for their upper weights and stuff. And, you know, you just never – like you want to be with people you connect with. So I came out. Um, August, early, early August, you know, and, and, uh, I interviewed with Zeke, you know, I, and I just kind of wanted to see, you know, the support from, from the administration. And, and when I came out here, I interviewed with two ADs, not one AD, two ADs. I interviewed with them and I hung out with them and talked to them, talked to them about wrestling, all these things. And, and I talked to Art and, uh, you know, and it was just really, it was really cool to see that they want to win here. And that was kind of what was like, yeah, I got to talk to my wife, but this is, this is what I want to do. So I got back and I was like, Sarah, we got to, and you know, she was, you know, she's always been supportive of my career and, and it was hard for her to leave state college. So, you know, I appreciate her all the time for doing that. What was that conversation like with coach Sanderson? Oh, it was a little awkward, but <laughs> I mean, and I think sometimes like, when somebody is leaving, it gets a little hard, but you know, I think we're fine now. Like so, a dude. little awkward, like he wanted to keep you. Yeah. That's a good awkward, my friend. Yeah, yeah. That's, so a, that's, was, to, that's a statement to you. That's that's a that's a, a testament to you, right? Yeah, I, I think so. It was I mean, I always tried my hardest at Penn State, you know, I always tried to make the program better and and leave it in a better place than I found it. And you know, when you do that you, people are going to notice when you're gone. So it's a good, yeah, right. It's a good thing. So it's been, it's been good. And then just being out here, man, it's, I don't know if you've ever really been to Phoenix or like, you know, around the surrounding Phoenix metropolitan area, but it's great. It's, we love it. You know, through, you know, we've only been here through from October. It was hot when we came out in August, but you know, my wife will go back to Pennsylvania probably for a lot of the summer. Yeah, it's 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 uh, really hot out there. So I was out. I get out west usually once a summer. Yeah. Most of my west stuff is I I'm out in fi- uh, wildfire country. Usually I'm in Montana, Idaho, uh, Oregon, or Washington is where I normally try and get right. Yeah, and it gets hot, but it's not Arizona, Phoenix hot. Yeah, you guys get like one fifteen, one twenty usually every day from like noon one to like five, right? Something like that. It's, it is. And it's so funny. Like my wife and I made fun of like all of like Frank and Kara and Pritz. Like, oh, it's the dry heat. It's not too bad. It, I will say, I will say. It, okay, like, come on, man. When the sun goes down, it is not nearly like it could be 90 degrees. It's not too bad. 
Okay. Because it's not humid. The whole dry heat thing. Just hold on. I got to cut you off. <laughs> Stick your head in an oven. <laughs> That's dry heat, right? Come on. No, yeah, it is still hot, hot, man. It is. But you get you into like also your body adjusts to it a little bit. So like when it hits like 75 and the sun's down here, I'm like putting on a sweatshirt. That's crazy. So one of my best friends lives um, in Phoenix. He lives in Phoenix. Uh, at WWE superstar Dolph Ziggler, as you know him, Nick Namath, as I know him. He lives yeah. uh, in Phoenix. So I was like, hey, um, do you, are you getting out to any uh, Arizona State duels? And I think he's just, like, got a lot going on because he travels a lot for WWE. And he's like, no, but I'm going to try to. I'm like, well, you made it to a Kent State duel this year where we got to watch Kent State lose seven matches to Ohio U. So – Maybe try and get to one of those uh, dual meets and support the yeah. – the- Come on, buddy. And What's then up, baby? Scottsdale as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he, it's, I mean, see, he needs to come down. Just tell him – let me know. You can reach out to me too if he wants yeah. to come down. I will. And I might get out there. I might, I'm trying to get out there. I really don't yeah. want to leave my family now. So, like, if I don't have to, no, I really don't. Me. You know it is. It's tough. It's tough. I do. How old are you? I got back from three and a half and one and a half. I got back from NCAs and my wife was like, all right. So our flight was at seven o'clock. So we had to be at the airport at, we had to leave a hotel at 445 on Saturday night. We got to the airport. We flew back. We, I landed at nine o'clock. I got to my house at, he's going to be using the jackhammer. I got to my house. Jack Hammer. I got to my house at frick, what was it? Maybe 10, 15 ish. And my wife's like, okay, well, you're back from vacation. Let's uh let's do this. Uh I I, I hate to break it to her. It was anything but a vacation. <laughs> yeah, so we immediately go to a park and we we're with my friends and I was like, all right, put on a brave face, get tough. That picture in the background dude that is so awesome so awesome that's your son yeah give me the backstory so those are the shoes i i hate the i hate i don't hate i just like like the wrestling the wedding wrestling the kids wrestling like and my wife's like well we got to do something like he has to have something with wrestling something and i'm like and she gets all mad at me because i don't like him you know he'll wrestle but we'll get there when we get there yeah and so she's like, well, we got to do something. So she made me bring my shoes. I wrestled in at the Olympic trials in 2016 and took that picture with them. That's really cool. That's like really cool, man. That's yeah, like cool. awesome. Um, what do you miss most about the Midwest, about Iowa, about uh, central Pennsylvania? What do you miss the most being in Arizona? Now? Uh, for me, like the, the thing I, I miss the kids at M2. I do. I miss, I miss working with those guys all the time. You know, some of the friendships and stuff that we built while, you know, you spend eight years in a place, you know, same thing with, with the Midwest, you know, you, just, you make friends and you build a community around you and, and then you have, you leave that community, you go build another one. And it's, and it's, it's hard, right? It's so hard. Like super hard, man, to leave a place and how you're, you're, you know, those, it's a coast to coast move essentially, right? It's like probably 1500 miles for you. Um, to state college state college to phoenix 1500 miles is that right 1800 no, miles something like that 2200 it's that far holy it took me wow. it took me 30 33 hours of driving oh my god oh my god hey we're at our hour can you give me a couple more minutes yeah yeah no problem a couple more minutes um favorite thing about dad life go uh when i get home every night it's like dad and it's, it's nice just like knowing people need you and, and they're counting on you. So it makes no matter what's going on a little bit easier. Do you know a week ahead of time, what's the schedule for you to recruit coming up here? Cause you, do, can you go out and recruit and do everything that everybody like Lee's doing or not? So I can't, I can't go. Um, I can't recruit off campus, but we have a busy couple of weekends coming up here. So you'll be on the campus and, and how far do you live off campus? 20 minutes. Well, so it's close. Little less, 20, 25 minutes. Yeah. How's Phoenix Tempe traffic? 
Not bad. You just have to, you know, it's funny. You just check like your phone every morning before you leave. Cause there's, I have like four different ways I can get to the university, you know, but I live like kind of South. So they have these two things called the one one and the two Oh two. And it's like two condensing loops that go all the way around the metropolitan area. So if that's cleared, I can get there in like 18 minutes. Favorite thing about being a coach compared to being an athlete? What is it? You're just off being an athlete in the last, you know, five, six years. Yeah. What's your favorite thing about being a coach compared to being an athlete? Just not it not being about me, it being about helping them. I think, you know, for me, I just put so much pressure on myself to like, and, and I know that's not right. And even I knew that even when I did it and I just couldn't beat that out of my brain. And I, and I did eventually, you know, it's more, I got it. Like, I think the last time I competed 2016 trials, I, I got beat first round by Medbury and I'd beaten him a hundred times, but I was so focused on winning that it was just, I, I couldn't have been more tired emotionally when I went into the match because of that. So it's just, you know, building these relationships with these guys and being a part of their lives and imp impacting them in a positive way and, and serving um, them. Biggest thing you miss about being an athlete, right? What would that be? Fighting somebody, just freaking going. Love it. Getting in a heater, just changing points and going. Dude. Double over hooking somebody, back arching yeah. them, doing all the crazy stuff yeah. you used to do, man. It was wild. Not caring about hurting them. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm not like trying to hurt people, but it, like, you know, like if I like shot hard on somebody and picked them up in the air, I immediately put them down softly. Whereas like when I was competing, I would have like ran to the out of bounds and like done like a backflip to try to <laughs> smash them. It's your, here's the thing about it. You didn't, you had no regard for yourself either. That's the other thing about that. Like that hurts. You too. Yeah, that's okay. It hurts them worse. <laughs> oh man. I mean, dude, you've, you've been working out with some really good heavy heavyweights from what, you know, Penn State's had obviously to now yeah. Colton. And you've, you know, obviously you're from heavyweight pedigree with Tolly Thompson and obviously coming from, Waverly Shell Rock, where the Green Leaves are from. So it's like awesome to hear the lineage of everything and how yeah, you've crazy. influenced people now, right? Yeah, I try to. I, you know, I just trying to be helpful, you know, and I think like that's one thing gets lost in like this coaching thing sometimes. It's like we're here to be helpful and nothing else, you know, and, and you know, help a kid, help a kid be help his life, help himself. Okay. The, the big one that I hear from everybody this is every coach. Probably not you, but every coach. Yeah. Heavyweight's the hardest weight to recruit. They, they all suck is what I hear. Heavyweight's the hardest weight to recruit. They all suck. I get that a lot. And then I guess the philosophy on the back end of that would be, if you're a really good big athlete, what are you doing in college? Yeah, you go play football, right? You, play, um, yeah, you know. But there's guys out there. I mean, you just got to find the kids, right? The kids are there. And it's, and it's really just – Finding the kid who, who truly loves wrestling. Colton Schultz loves wrestling. He absolutely wakes up every day and wrestling is the first thing he thinks of. You know, and, and, and it's funny, I was talking to, talking to him about this a little bit. It's like, you know, I just, I was thinking to myself the other day and I was, my wife and I woke up in the morning and she asked me, well, hey, what, when's practice? It was like Saturday and I was like, oh, this or that time, you know, it's like, I was thinking to myself, I was like, I don't remember the last time that wrestling wasn't the first thing that dictated what happened in my life. And I, and that's what I kind of want. You know what I mean? I, I built that into my life. That's, that's, this is what I love. So why would I want to, you know, I love my family, you know, obviously that's first, but they are on board too. Right. My wife loves this wrestling stuff. She loves seeing me in my habitat, being with the people that I care about and stuff. So She's fully on board with it, and I'm very thankful for that. But, I mean, that's one thing. Like, you find a kid whose life is like that, right? I, I missed a lot of stuff, you know, growing up. Like, birth, I was talking birthday parties, sweet 16, you know, whatever it is, proms, things that in the moment they seem so big, but you're either going to find a heavyweight who cares about wrestling that way or you're you're going to find a kid who's part-time. And, and, like, that. not that, that they can still be good, but – 
you know, I would say most division one wrestling coaches are like me. So it's going to be hard to connect with someone who isn't all in. Is Gable Stevenson the best heavyweight you've ever seen? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think so. I think so. I, I got to, you know, I think Gable at the Olympics was, was one of the best versions of a heavyweight I've ever seen. Pretty incredible. And how about for the first time ever in all this international wrestling I've ever watched, I've been, ever, I've seen it all, man. Worlds, Olympics, in person, right? World Cup as a kid, all this stuff. I've been to all of it. The first time I've ever seen an American get a call. Yeah, that was <laughs> with the state, How they brought him up. You never should have done that. That should have just no. been it. Right? No. Yeah, yeah. Like I've ne- I, like usually they'll keep you down longer. You start looking at. It. I feel oh, like yeah. that rock was just so caught. I, I mean, it, and it happens, right? How many times have we seen it? A ref gets caught up in the moment, like of like, like oh, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. And then like they are like not cheering because I mean I don't. It's a little different. You start getting overseas, but you know I think that sometimes they get caught up in the moment and they just lose their minds. I'm glad he did. I'm not gonna. Lie. I'm really glad he did. But you know what? I think we'd have Gable three more years if he would, wouldn't have. I mean, that's just me. I don't know. I don't know, man. I think we'll get him back. But I mean, for you guys, I mean, you're you're against a, a murderous field anyway. I mean, you're gonna have to find a way to win a big one anyway. And you got Colton three more years, right? That's correct. I and mean, that's you build a program around a guy like that. Yeah, I mean, he's he's uh, he's second to none, right? His his personality and just find somebody to say a bad word about him and you won't dude he could have told me to kick rocks when i was waiting around for him to get the gregorian and i was like hey let's do an interview and he's like all right well this deep well, all right i was like all right yeah. man cool he'll and, never you know, yeah he would never say that. no that's I'm, hard and he did it the closest you know that's that's hard man for a kid to go and to go up and ask him i mean they don't want to do it they really don't want to do it. they don't want to talk it's tough it sucks i just lost what do you want you know what i mean but it's a maturity thing. Is he a lot more mature than you think you were at that age? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He 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 uh, he handles all this stuff pretty well. You know, he needs a little a little. You know, like his the things he's dealing with are a little bit different. You know, some of the people that are coming to him now, it's exciting stuff for him, and I'm just pumped up for him. You know, and the things that are in front of him, right? You know, Greco World Team. Hopefully, go get a medal. You know, and go do do what he wants to do. Where's Greco Worlds this year for senior level? He told me the other day. Yeah, because you're probably going to have to go. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to run around a little bit. It's all right. All right. I know. I was like, I was thinking that the other day. I was like, I'm kind of thankful. I had to wrestle Greco against uh, Ben Provisor a bunch all the time at NLWC when he was there. Yeah. Because tell you what, if I didn't, I would be a lot worse than it already is. So. Oh, my God. Um. I got the video of you guys. He's Lee's rubbing Colton down before the finals, right? He's like getting getting warmed up, and you're just kind of oh, like yeah, pumping yeah. him up, right? Did you see that video? Yeah, yeah, I did, I did. Thanks for not smashing my face and throwing my camera. I appreciate that. Twenty five pounders and heavyweights, man. A tail as old as time. <laughs> no buck ends, right? <laughs> yeah, you gotta have Zeke's them. tiny too. Zeke Zeke was like that too. Oh, He's yeah. an itty bitty guy. I tell him and Pritz all the time they're throwing off 25 pounder energy. I'm like, you two just start vibrating the closer we get to the finals or something. I'm like, everyone relax. Okay. Last thing I got the probably the most iconic photo from the weekend is uh teamer and Rob, right? That's crazy. How crazy is that? And what's that say about your program in, in uh, Tempe? I think it tells you, you know, that, that Zeke, Frank and Lee are building something you know, are building something special and they're bringing people in and they're doing things different and in their tell and Frank's mindset stuff, telling the kids, you know, they, you know, you just got to compete hard and good things will happen. And, and that's what you saw at the end of that match. Like Corey just goes and he does what Corey can do. It, it's a pretty incredible thing to see. Um, and, and that's the testament to, to Frank, you know, and his efforts with Corey and Parco. And just, you know, how much better they've gotten and how close they are to that that cusp of, of greatness. And, and not that they aren't great, but it's just they're right there to do something truly, truly special. And that's because of Frank. I love it.
Yeah, I'm a I'm a fan of the whole coaching staff, top to bottom. Little yeah, look, look, guys, look, all the way to big gigantic guy. Yeah, look what Lee's done with you know 125 and 133, Mikhail McGee and and Brandon Courtney. Like that's insane. They're they're really dangerous, both of them. They're hard to deal with. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to wrestle either one of those guys from space. I mean, no, it's so they, scary. They, they're they're so explosive from space. Both of them, yeah. it's like awesome to watch. Chikori, obviously. Uh, Parco though, Parco with the the two on ones and the underhooks, he's a hard. That guy's a load, right? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And then, will you retain Valencia as a, a an RTC athlete? Probably. I think so. I think he wants to stay and wants to keep training. So hopefully, we get to keep him forever. He's a great person. He's a great addition to the program. You know, then, to the RTC. So Zahid's still in, right? Yeah, we still have Zahid, um, Josh Shields, and Josh Kramer. Okay. And then we and then, we, and then uh, Forrest, Helen, Kayla, Dom, Maya. Wow. That's wow. And then Mark Perry heads up Sunkist right now, correct? Yeah, one of the best, dude. One of the best to be in it right now. Just a crazy mind. You know, he's a huge he's been so helpful to me this year. Um trying to game plan and do some of that stuff. Just his opinion is invaluable. He's pretty smart. Yeah. He's got the got the Oklahoma Perry mindset, Smith Perry mindset, right? Yeah, wrestling. His right. mom is John's sister, right? I think so. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Um, your dad and Tolly are first cousins, is that right? My dad and Tolly's dad are brothers. Your dad and Tolly's dad are brothers. Okay. So the first cousin yeah, they're first cousins. Yep. Okay. I love it. No nephew. He's my dad's nephew. He's your dad's nephew. Got it. Now it makes sense. Cousins, your cousins. Me and Tyler are first cousins, yeah. Okay, got it. He's a lot older than you, though. Yeah, I mean, not, my dad has eight brothers and sisters. <laughs> Were they farmers? Oh, uh, yeah. I love it. The little northeast, northeast Iowa farmers, right? Yeah. Probably a pretty common theme out there, would be my guess. It's not, it's not rare. It's not rare. Hey, I got a new John Deere, by the way. Did you a big one? How big? <sighs> no, I got the 25 horsepower. This is, listen, this is what I'm going to leave you with. Do you miss splitting wood? Do you miss Midwest stuff that you can't do in Arizona? Yeah, so it's funny. I told my wife, I was like, you know, the we so our house we bought, you know, I had to do, we moved into this house and I was like, the pandemic hit like eight months after we moved in and it needed a bunch of updates and new flooring and stuff. And I'm like doing all this flooring, you know, during the pan, during when everything shut down. So I'm like, do new flooring, new bathrooms, new paint the cabinets, do this, do that. And I, and then I like finally get all this stuff done and it's like still March. And I'm like, kind of bored. So I just go back into the woods, you know, we had an acre and I cut down 80 saplings that were probably like six inches in diameter. And I just chopped them up. And I had crazy, unnecessarily big fires in my fireplace every single night. <laughs> Did she yell at you, didn't she? Oh, yeah. She got pissed. Because every night I would just, just I'd go to the garage and i take my hatchet and i just put it on and just make kindling. And she's like, be more annoying. <laughs> so, it was fun, man. I, I, do miss, I do miss my fireplace. And, you know, here, like, my house, the house was built in 2020, so there's not, like, anything to do on it which is good because I don't have any time, you know, but you can, I heard it a couple times. We're getting our backyard, um, putting, getting some turf put down for the kids and stuff, but. Turf, you got to get turf put down. How about that? Like I'll, everybody I talk to, yeah, I got rocks in my yard. I'm like, what? You got rocks in your yard. So my front yard mows the lawn there. Literally nobody mows the lawn in Tempe, Phoenix, Scottsdale. No one's mowing lawns. No, because you're paying too much for water then to to keep a nice lawn. People, I mean, people do it. Like I think they're out of their minds, but people do it. That blows my mind, dude. I asked you this week, and I go, "Do you miss the smell of grass?" And you're like, "Not really," <laughs> because it's always crap you got to do, right? It's like yeah. here, I don't, I don't have to do anything. I go tinker with the water system, like the water line a little yeah. bit here and there, and then I like I prune stuff. I have a nasty mesquite tree in my backyard that has like these like inch inch and a half thorns on them that are like hard so i have to like trim all these branches down and just get like poked and i'm like 
And then I have to go through with like this like double handled knife and I just pull it down the sides and rip off all the bark so it, it oh doesn't grow the thorns. And it'll live? It'll live through that? Dude, this place is dangerous. Arizona <laughs> is dangerous. Scorpions, rattlesnakes, the heat will kill you. Javelina, coyotes. Oh, javelina is like the little pig, right? They're not little. There's some monsters out here, dude. Monsters. Can you kill them? Yeah, there's a season for them and stuff. But I guess they stink really bad. They have like these glands or something. I saw it. They popped up. So we, you move here and you have to get like a blink or a ring doorbell. And they popped up on our ring. They're eating my bushes out front. So I got to figure that out. They'd go out and whack them with a bat or something. I know. I was just grab my high horn. Do they have a I'm horn? Like, do they have tusks? Yeah, they do. Like but they a, look like they're, a razorback? They're super, they're super strange looking. Like they kind of look like. It's a pig. It's a pig. It's a pig pig but it it looks like i don't even know like an like a like a guinea pig that's like huge but their legs are like inch in diameter like skinny it's like it's it's strange man they're not like a normal like you know like a pig on a farm they got the big hooves like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, these things are like running on like pegs that's so weird i love it's it strange. though but it's you got to be careful because you can't leave your kids outside alone my yeah. kids can go outside here I did have a koi wolf walk up on me once when my son Ferdinand was a baby. What's a koi um, wolf? But a oh, koi coyote. Is big, dude. A koi wolf is big. It is not like a coyote. You guys have wolves there? Koi wolf. Okay, so that yeah. what happens? They came they walked over Lake Erie in like the nineties, I want to say. When yeah. Lake Erie froze completely and they, they came over from the provincial parks. And one rolled up on me one day, dude. It was like the size of a German shepherd. Uh, that's too scary. Oh, I don't like that. Animal. And then the They're coyotes, we got a lot of coyotes around here. A lot of coyotes. I got a neighbor who turns them inside out. Does he? he shoots them with like a 30 out six. <laughs> you, you can shoot a coyote with whatever you want here. You know that, right? Because it's a it's a uh nuisance. Nuisance, yeah. It's a nuisance, and you're allowed you're allowed to there's like no season. You can do whatever you want with those. I would have to look, but my, my area is pretty residential. We live in Ahwatukee, so it's like Alex it's like kind of South Phoenix. A little bit further south, but we live in this place called the Foothills. So it's like kind of like like it'll be my house, my neighborhood, and then like across the road or like up a little bit is like a big foothill that's like okay. totally barren, like but it has trails on it and stuff. But that's where they kind of come from. But I haven't seen a scorpion yet either. I've seen lizards everywhere, but we haven't seen a scorpion. Rattlesnake? Sure. What's that? Rattler? Any rattlers? Rattlesnakes? No, no. But I think they come out in the summer is what they say. Like, they come down from the mountains in the summer. Oh, they're probably in, like, hibernation, suspended animation type deal right now, aren't they? Yeah, something made up that lizards and snakes do. <laughs> I love it, dude. All right. You got anything else for me? Uh, forks up. When you get some kids from Ohio. Uh, th- listen, I show this to people, and they don't know what I'm talking about. I'm like, probably Wichita State. Yeah, I'm like, no, this is Forks Up. This is Tempe, right? Tempe, baby. I love love it. All right. Let me know if you're going to come to Tempe this summer. I'm trying to if I can, if I can do it on a weekend or something. But okay, check out Barbarian Apparel, barbarianapparel.com. We're going to sign off real quick here with Coach Thompson, Arizona State University. Coach, stick around. We'll talk real quick afterwards, all right? Sounds good. Thanks for having me on.